We arrived at one o'clock in the morning, exhausted, after driving ten hours. But we woke up the next morning and we walked out the street and we saw goats in all sorts of shapes and forms being trucked around and dragged, down, dragged the down the street. You knew within the first half an hour of seeing the scene that it was going to be good. Yeah, it's fantastic at this stage. Lots of flies, but uh, no, it's fantastic. Well, well worth the trip coming up. Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how, how we can go with the racing, but at the moment, yeah, it's pretty frantic and there's lots of action and it's pretty funny. <laughs> it's it's such, a, such an Australian thing to race goats down the main street in, in sort of the, the suburbia of, of the outback. It's just fantastic. Stand in front of the goat like that. Watch the catcher. The catcher's just going to go ready, bang, right? So when he says ready, you on the front. Step to the side. So you step on the side, the catch him. And listen, whatever you do, don't pat the goat or squeeze him. I know from experience they just want to turn around and fight. Right, it won't help them none. Alright, bring your wheels forward on the line. The orange is in the lead, followed by the red. The red and the blue are fighting out at the middle of the track. And the orange is doing a bit of a bit of bending there, a bit of bending. Keep it well back there. Red's looking good. Yes, look out. Quick. Got that goes, got that goes. Oh, we're going to get in that ball. Yes, we've got a winner there. The orange is coming first, followed by the green. Help the red long. Come on. How about that, ladies and gentlemen? It was pretty funny. <laughs> I didn't expect it to be so crazy, I guess, but uh, yeah, it's, it was hilarious. And it looked great running, everyone just running and just going all over the place, you know, spreading out and people crashing and yeah, it was, so I'm glad no one got hurt though. <laughs> <laughs> it's just pandemonium. It's absolute chaos. You don't know where they're going. I'm going to get cleaned up, I'm sure, but you've got to be in there. You've got to be in there to get the pictures, to get really good pictures. You've got to be as close as possible to them, so that's why you've got to risk, take a bit of a risk. Number six. I'll leave my white handle. This guy's just pissed himself. Is that enough? We've only got a couple of hours to actually get a story from it and get the images that might actually present to someone else what happened in those few hours. So we get a bit frantic and we get a bit possessed <laughs> for a while. There's so much happening, it's not just the actual races, it's looking for all the, the uh, uh, stuff that's going on in like, the peripheral areas. Like you, To put together an essay you need a lot of pictures and we look to, look, look to work in 12 picture essays. So it's all the little detailed pictures that actually form around the event, not just the actual race. So it's important to keep working through the crowd, looking for all tiny little observations that actually make up the bigger picture. <laughs> Green on 13. 
Our work is very personal. It's about um, showing uh, the rest of the people in Australia the way they live through our eyes. Just in terms of the number in this hall, right. I don't want to drop one. It's a shame because like, the flow of it at the exactly. moment no, is no, perfect. I, I agree 100%. Yeah. Seven years work and then it finally goes up onto the wall. When I was working on the newspaper, I found it incredibly frustrating to have my pictures butchered by uh, journalists who have no experience in photography whatsoever and who are picture illiterate. I realised that the only real way to have my pictures seen in the way that I wanted them was to get our work into gallery <laughs> shows where you did have the respect of yeah, curators and Maybe. people were wanting something of you because it was your style and they were wanting to see a, a part of you. Well, the, the most horrible experience that you could ever possibly have was when my mum, she had an asthma attack one night, my dad was at squash, it was just me at home with my two younger brothers and she died very suddenly of an asthma attack and I suppose from that moment on obviously it changed my life and the way that I've looked at life ever since and have been able to, I suppose it gave me eyes for life in a way that it made everything and every moment more precious and I treasure everything that is around me now and every, every moment I get to, that I am here on this, on this earth, it is uh, the most wonderful thing for me to experience everything that is going around me. I use the camera to, to get out on the streets and watch the people, watch the masses, watch the way that uh, people interacted and it became like a drug. I just had to get out there. Every, every waking moment I had to get out on the street and watch. What I am shooting is a reflection of myself. The picture of the guy standing in the rain, he's almost representative of myself, standing on street corners, looking out, watching life go by. Um, come down to New South Wales Police Headquarters because um, Commissioner Ryan has either announced his retirement or has been forced into retirement, not really sure yet. Just waiting now for him to make an appearance, I guess, either willingly or unwillingly. <laughs> I'm not really sure, but his wife apparently just got into a car. So, who knows, he might be in there or not. <laughs> These sort of jobs when you're chasing people around, they're very adrenaline stimulating jobs I guess but they're probably not my favourite sort of job because I'd like to work more with the picture and come up with a picture I like whereas these jobs you're just grabbing a picture you get whatever you get it can be very exciting and but sometimes it's too nerve-wracking as well. Did you get him get in the car? No. Did you get him get in the car? No, no, they did it downstairs. Sometimes no matter how much effort you put in and no matter how many hours you spend waiting and watching for someone, you still miss them. And that's part of the job as well, is that you have, have to have a lot of patience and sometimes it doesn't come off. They planned that well. You get it? Snuck out. Did you get nah. anything there? Nah. It's a pretty bloody long shot from yeah. uh, where you were. Uh, Hello? Hello. 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 Thanks for down there. We, just, we just missed him at the police centre at Goldman. Oh, really? Anyway, 
Here's your next job. Thanks. The surf rescue vehicle is meant to take the surf lifesavers to a um, drowning person. A lot of the time working with a newspaper you have to illustrate the story. So sometimes the best picture may not be used because it's, it doesn't literally tell what's happening in the story and that can be a frustration. Of course, the water babies. <laughs> The Herald Water It's great, team. it's got a really nice feel to it. Yeah, I've got a couple of others, but I think that one's got a really... Oh, and it feels like it's kind of happening, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know? Like, I've got page one. I think that's the first page one I've had in about a year. Nice picture to get it with, the, even though it's a setup. <laughs> you can't say that. Oh. <laughs> it was really clear. It was really clear. I mean, it was just... My love for Trent grew out of just being uh, amazingly impressed by him. He was just so, so passionate by life, you know, there was just such an energy about him and, you know, it's really intoxicating, I guess, so I was instantly attracted to him. It was fantastic to meet someone that you could be in love with and also go on this fantastic journey um, as photographers and, and in life. I suppose I fell in love with Narelle as soon as I saw her. Because <laughs> um, she was absolutely beautiful, for one thing. And then after talking to her, there was a significant realisation that Narelle was the person I was going to spend the rest of my life with. And we also found that there was this uh, intense passion for what we did in terms of work and so forth. So it was an easy transition, I suppose, to stop working as an individual and work as a team. And so we've, as I think someone put it, we're partners in life and, and art. The seventh wave started on a dreamy Saturday afternoon in crystal clear water without a cloud in the sky and we were swimming around and just playing like kids again and there was this sense of something's happening here. We never looked through the camera when we were actually shooting the seventh wave. It was always a process of holding the camera out in front of you, hoping that you're looking at the scene and then just hitting the button. It was the first time we had worked together and it, it was really good to bounce off each other and sometimes one person would not come back with anything and that would make them really want to get out there the next day and, and get great pictures.
we lived near the bridge, so we'd go down there a lot and we'd walk over the bridge to the city. I love looking down and seeing these people laying or playing. There's this real sense of freedom, you know, there's a, there's a free spirit to them. They did have this sense that they're kind of fallen from heaven and then they had this, no, there's no sense of gravity to them almost. going um, photographing on the bridge because it's you know you're high up you know it's windy and you know holding the I'm holding the camera out sort of wrapped around my wrist and over the the bridge so it's it's really hard going on the muscles and constantly breathing in fumes coming back with uh, bruises on her on her forearms from resting for so long trying to hold that heavy camera out over the, the edge go on a bit now. How's your arms going? Oh, <laughs> They all laid back with. Always watching people eat. <laughs> I'm not eating yourself. Things will suddenly reveal themselves. You know, people will be laying there, and suddenly the light will hit them through the shadows, and you know, you'll get a picture just from just for that instant, and then it will move on again. And I love the structure of the bridge, it's amazing, the, the crosses and stuff that fall on the ground and so I, it's sort of waiting for that, the drama to happen on the stage, you know, that you're looking at. It's up there now as well. Yeah, nice. It's pretty yeah. nice here with the shadows and stuff. Yeah, it's been good the shadows. The last few years after meeting Narelle and living life with her has been, has changed my life. And my series since then has become lighter in the fact that I don't see the city quite as alienating as I used to. And the latest series of work I've been doing is, is using light in, in a way that I'm waiting, I'm looking for strips of light and waiting for people in white to walk into these strips in the everyday, exposing for the, the shadow areas so that the rest of the actual scene appears normal, but the people who are in white walking into these heavy shafts of light are blowing out in this sort of angelic sense. look for light because it's very dramatic it's just using you know what you've been given you know which is the sun As people come out and pass those shadows it's good today because you've got the rush get the... oh look the, te the steeples lit up as well yeah that's the same with the shadows on the wall there I think it's definitely going to be nicer in colour, this picture. There's about five elements to the picture. There's people that are, we're waiting for people to walk out of the shadow into the light, and then people to walk past on the right hand side, people to come out of the train station on the left hand side, produce a shadow onto the wall in the blackness, and they're being lit up because it is a black wall and it's nice and clean and then the steeple in the background. The light's fading very fast. There's strips of light in the city that Trent may go back to a dozen times and spend two hours at a time trying to get that picture. And people don't understand that patience because a lot of people don't have that patience. We're after things that are hard, you know, that, are, that take a lot of time. And so that's the said, our rush at the end is much more exciting because it's something that, you know, it's just happened. It's like a magic moment. Oh, that's Girl, wicked today. So 
I mean, it's just, yeah, it's just glowing against the black here. So, and because the wind's blowing the, uh, the mist into the, the kind of black area, it's showing up even more. So it's gorgeous. It's just waiting for something to happen, though. <laughs> I'm always looking for the rawness, the, the realness of life. I like to just grab the moments quickly. I don't, sometimes I don't frame, I shoot from the hip, I don't uh, put my camera up to my eye, and it's just a, an instantaneous reaction from myself to just grab that picture, just see it and shoot it. really know there's no way we can say this is what we're looking for it's just waiting and sometimes you can shoot for a lot of time and you won't get anything and that's the thing we don't know until we get it that that's what we've found I love that that moment that wasn't there before and then suddenly it is and you've got it and it'll never be there again Overseas, we're known as Trent and Narelle, uh, <laughs> the roadkill couple. <laughs> it's it's one series that definitely uh, touched the the hearts and uh, of of a lot of people. And it was a series that we did. Uh, we were travelling back to Narelle's place over at, at a Christmas time, and we couldn't believe the amount of dead animals that we were coming across on the road. We started stopping and looking at them and as a result photographing them and then we realised how many um, different types of native animals were being killed on the roads. particular animal always matches the uh, grasslands or areas that they've come from on the side of the road, like the yellow snake and you've got the yellow grass on this side. Come out of their camouflage for a second and it's good night. Splat is the generic term we come up with for an animal that had been run over so many times that it was no longer identifiable. And there's a lot of those. I would like people to just be aware more of the animals that are living, you know, that you know they're driving through their space, that that stick on the road might be a lizard, you know, and just go round it instead of going over it. If we can photograph them in a beautiful way, in a way that people can accept and look at, but also see the sadness, it actually enables us to get a message across. If we didn't do it in the way we did it in such a sort of surreal, beautiful way, no one would look at it. <laughs>